Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Pass to Professionalism event sponsored by the School of Management. As a reminder, please remember to keep your audio off for the duration of the event and be sure to click speaker in the top right corner of your screen to gain the most from this event. My name is Bridget Caffrey. I'm a senior majoring in business administration and marketing and will be one of your MCs this evening. My fellow classmates assisting this event are McKenna Alter, a senior also majoring in business administration with an emphasis in marketing, who will be our panel moderator, and Kevin Howe Conche, a junior majoring in business administration with an emphasis in business economics, who will be our MC for the end of the event. Before we begin the panel discussion, I'd like to share a little bit about the PATHS program. So by engaging both alumni and industry partners as panelists, the mission of this event is to hopefully inspire students to develop your own career path and path to professionalism. We hope to accomplish this today by hearing from our panelists on kind of how their career path has progressed after graduation and within their chosen discipline. So this may include skills and abilities that they have learned are valued by their employer or by their industry, the value of networking opportunities in your industry, and then of course, how to navigate through the barriers to find your path to success and happiness. During the panel discussion, we also encourage you to share your own questions for the panelists through the chat function. Please private chat me, Bridget Caffrey, with your questions. These will be answered later in the event. After the panel discussion, we are thrilled to welcome back many of our recent alums from the School of Management who have graciously volunteered to lead each of our breakout rooms. These alums have agreed to share a little bit about their experience since graduating and then answer any questions you might have about the job search. This is a great opportunity to network and then connect on LinkedIn. One more important point, we will run a raffle after the breakout rooms, so stick around to the end. We want your feedback on this event and there will be 10 winners with great prizes. Now I would like to introduce Dean Gerhard. Well, thank you very much, Bridget. And let me just say this, uh, thanks for picking the song as well. Brought back memories from my teenagehood and still gives me goosebumps. goosebumps. Good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to have you here tonight. The Path to Professionalism event has been hosted by the School of Management for a long time. Aligned with the mission of Cal Lutheran, the event is hosted each spring to add a final step and some refinement to find on your journey, uh, to find purpose or discover your passion on your journey. From this event, it's our hope that you're inspired to discover your own path or profession. Each professional discipline may value its own set of skills and abilities that lead to career growth. They may also have professional standards, codes, ethics, and expected behaviors that as an educational institution, we must prepare you for. This event is offered each spring prior to the university's career expo, where we hope you continue to explore these paths by engaging with employers. This engagement may also include discovering skills valued in internships or postgraduate roles that you can prepare for or add to your asset inventory, regardless of your year of study. Continuing to support the university's mission, the development of this year's event included engaging students in the event development, its positioning and execution. I would like to personally thank the School of Management students, Bridget Caffrey, McKenna Alter, and Kelvin Haokanche in volunteering to work with our faculty, staff, and guests to transition this to a virtual event. I hope this experiential opportunity provides great experience you can leverage in finding your path and your passion. I would also like to thank our panelists, of course, and our alumni for contributing their time to inspiring our students to discover their own path, and more importantly, to take ownership of it now so that they may develop skills required by employers to differentiate themselves in a highly competitive job market. And lastly, student audience, I would like to thank you especially for taking the initiative in owning your career path by joining us tonight. I wish you a great event and thanks for being here again. Thank you so much, Dean Gerhard, for your inspirational words. I would now like to pass it on to McKenna Alter, who will be introducing the panel and moderating their discussion. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you so much, the Dean. Um, hello, everyone. It is wonderful to see all of you today in this virtual setting, of course. Uh, first off, I would like to say a big thank you to all of my colleagues within the School of Management for planning this really incredible event. And also a big thank you to all of our wonderful panelists and table leads who have joined us today. This event really would not be possible without your engagement and support. So to start off this event, I would like to introduce our fantastic panelists for the night. We have Robert Machado and Marc Francois. Unfortunately, we were unable to have Gabby Ramirez and Marielle Yuri due to technical difficulties, but we do have two incredible panelists here for you all today, as well as many past Cal Lutheran alumni who are gonna be joining us further in the event for our Q&A, which will be a fantastic opportunity to network and find your career path. So in the chat, we'll be including a link to all of our full event page where you're going to have the ability to view our panelists full bios, which includes all their LinkedIn addresses if you're interested in connecting with them further after this event has concluded. So starting off our, introdu uh, our introductions today, we're going to start with Mark. So if you can give me a quick uh, four minute uh, brief overview of your own career path and how you got to where you are today, that'd be fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you, McKenna. Um, so my career is kind of a weird and winding road. Um, I So if you look at my bio right now, it says I'm vice president of development for Sea Glass Hospitality Partners. And that's true. Although I have just taken on a new role also as a director of policy and partnerships for Haitian American Caucus. It's a foundation in New York that operates a school in Haiti and then provides uh, community outreach services for um, uh, Haitian communities uh, throughout the United States and globally. So it's kind of a, a strange and winding road how I got here. Um, my career started in hospitality. Uh, my dad worked for Hilton for 50 years. And so when I was a student at Kowloon, um, out of sheer laziness, I started looking into hotel projects to use in, in my classes as, as like templates for various projects I had to turn in because of ease of access to information. And then when it came time to start looking for jobs and internships, um, I was able to go with my dad to some hotel conferences and Dr. Guerrero, my advisor at the time, um, when I was, uh, so my major was uh, business administration with a marketing emphasis. And Dr. Guerrero was my advisor and she suggested that if I was gonna be going to these trade shows, I could get credit for that. So I did. And then I started going to every trade show I could my last two years at Kowloon managed to get, I don't know, five or six credits for it over the, the course of the next couple of years. But that got me my first hotel job. Met a developer at a, uh, <clears throat> at a conference in Arizona. Started as an intern doing acquisitions and entitlement planning, building hotels, purchasing for hotels. And then when the economy turned in 2008, went back to, uh, went back to the drawing board, started working in operations at a tiny little Hilton Garden Inn, went to a bigger hotel, um, and then it moved to San Diego, bounced around and managed a few hotels. And then went finally back, uh, in 2017 to the real estate side, acquiring, um, raising capital and, and putting deals together that way. So that kind of brings us up to, uh, up to today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, wonderful introduction for us today. Um, now we're going to transition to Robert. Hi everyone, I'm Rob Machado. Um, so let's see, my brief career short summary is, I was with Disney for a little over 25 years, which is where I met Professor Cosentino. Uh, my first job was a lifeguard. I wanted to work in marketing. Um, and so I was able to find uh, a way to work in marketing jobs there. Um, after that, I really made it, made it clear that I wanted to try all aspects of Disney. So I was able and lucky enough to work in uh, international marketing for our animated films. Um, I then worked for the parks for a long time again. I worked for ABC television here in New York where I am right now, uh, though working for ABC was a long time ago, ESPN, um, for the corporate division. And then um, more recently, I was uh, vice president of corporate alliances and operating participants in Shanghai Disney Resort. So I lived in China for about five years uh, to be one of the lead executives opening the park there. I came back to, um, to be what's called head of commercial strategy for the parks uh, in Florida, which is really uh, a role we can talk a little bit about uh, further during the session if you'd like. And then um, I left Disney actually about a year and a half ago after a project that I said would be my final one. I'm currently the president and chief operating officer of a 
Mars City Design Startup, which is designing systems, habitats uh, to sustain off-planet living, specifically Mars, but potentially the moon. And I also am starting an executive uh, part-time role with uh, the largest uh, not-for-profit in uh, anti-human trafficking. So um, that's why I'm here in New York uh, now, back to New York, and um, it's good to be here. So thanks, that's my quick summary. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Mark and Rob, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I know that you guys are gonna provide amazing stories for us on how, on how we can really take those great steps to, to push forward to creating our own professional career and, and endeavors within the future. Um, so thank you so much. And I think it's really important to see how every single professional success story really has to begin somewhere. And every single opportunity that has been taken on really does contribute to the future success and finding one's passion um, for their career. So for our first question, um, what we're gonna do, we're gonna start talking about um, all about prior goals and mindset while in college. So as students, and especially early on within our educational careers, we have all of these goals where we wanna work professionally, sometimes even have dream places to work. With that in mind, when looking back at your own personal experience in college, what did you envision for yourself and your future professional endeavors? And fast forwarding to the present day, how, are those, how have those past goals aligned with your current career? Um, well, it's where I, where I thought I would be in college compared to where I am now is uh, completely divergent from one another, frankly. Um, so when I was in college, everything I was looking at was sort of centered around my job title and the kind of paycheck it might bring me and really following in the hotel industry on what was going to be the path of least resistance, what I could use the most connections for to, to you know, piece things together and not have to work very hard, uh, <laughs> if I'm being honest. So, you know, that tra that transformed a lot, you know, throughout my career and was and was um, experiencing different different setbacks, different challenges. Um, you know, the 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 recession in 2009 was a big one. I spent about 16 and a half months uh, looking for work uh, before I found like, you know, a steady non retail job. And then you know, sort of went through a second phase of that in my career over, over the last year as, um, as COVID has sort of torpedoed the, the hospitality and tourism industry and uh, the civil unrest. So I'm, I'm pretty involved in politics and policy. And so one of the things I've made a, a decision to do was to pursue my passion and try to make uh, the skills I've acquired over the course of a hospitality career work in a different space to make the world a better place than how I found it. So started exploring organizations that aligned with my ethics and aligned with my passions. And then sort of within that scope, using um, my skills and sort of in a like a SWOT analysis and appraisal of what my abilities were to figure out what kind of jobs in that space I might be able to do. So could I have ever imagined, you know, that I'd be doing policy and partnerships for a foundation in New York? No, I totally thought I'd be in the hotel industry as a lifer because that was what my family did. And um, to be honest with you, I'm really glad I pursued my passion and we'll, we can talk about that more as we go along. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. And I think it's, it's really, it's really important to know, especially going into going into college, you know, we, we go in with all these expectations of where we're going to be, and you really don't know where you're going to be until you, you put yourself out there in those situations where, you know, you put yourselves in those internships, you have all those extracurricular involvement, and you, you try these different jobs and roles that you never think maybe would be a good fit until you're actually in it, and then you realize it's your passion. And so I think that's really important. And that's fantastic. And I love that. So my mom, my mom thanks. says she's, uh, she's in her 60s. And she says she still doesn't know what she wants to do when she grows up. And I think that's really true. Um, you're, you don't have to like, yes, you'll have goals in mind. Yes. You'll have uh, certain ideas in mind, things you're working towards, but I think if you're flexible towards sort of the pivot opportunities that, that life will throw at you, you're going to find, um, much more meaningful paths opening up, opening up to you. If you're, if you're responsive to that. Absolutely. And I'm a firm believer that you don't go a day in your life without learning something new. So Definitely. Absolutely. That is a huge and important point that I think is really valuable. And so now moving on to, uh, to Rob, uh, how would you respond to this question? 
Yeah, I'm going to hook on to something that Mark said um, that I wish I had, someone had told me when I was in college, quite frankly, which is try not to be too specific with your goals. So there's no way that your 20 year old self knows what's best for your 35 year old self. As much as you'd like to think so, it's going to evolve. And so if you really tie yourself to very, very specific things, you're either going to be going for a goal that a 20 year old set for your 30 something year old self, which is probably not the best thing, or you're going to set yourself up for disappointment and whatnot. So um, for me, what I'd say is I just wanted to make TV commercials. Like that's all I wanted to do when I was young, when I was in college, my, I was an engineering major and I, someone told me to do that because I was good at math and I hated it. Um, so I said, I literally packed up and moved to Florida when I was 19, decided to continue my degree there and went into Disney and said, hi, I'm Rob, I'm 19 and I'd like to make TV commercials. And uh, so they made me a lifeguard, which was nice because uh, I had lifeguarded before. And then, you know, three years later, I found myself editing my first uh, Southeastern United States, like Coca-Cola Disney TV promo. Um, so I, you know, I kind of, I describe goals as sort of this cloud up there of like, really try to think through what you really enjoy doing if there's a job that does that. And just don't make it too, too specific. Like you can't grab onto it too, too much, but sort of a direction you'd like to go towards. Um, and then one day the opportunity will present itself. So I was a lifeguard and I asked my bosses, what can I do to demonstrate that I'm like smarter than just sitting by a pool? And so they gave me the worst job you can do, which is scheduling 110 people every week, uh, which in operations is known as the worst job you can possibly have. So I did that for a while and then they gave me more and more. And then finally someone sat me down and say, how can I help you with your career? And I said, I'd like to make TV commercials. So they gave me an internship in marketing and long story short, I just waited for the opportunity and someone was upset because they had a spot that they had to deliver with Coke by the end of two weeks. And they couldn't get in the editing bay with the tape vault because all the people were backed up. And I heard them say that. And I happened to be dating the girl who scheduled everything in the tape vault. And so I said, well, I'll tell you what, like, if you give it to me to edit, to like edit it all for you, um, I'll give you a draft. And if it goes well, great. And if not, I'll convince, you know, my girlfriend to give you time in the tape vault. And after that, I guess I did an okay job and I started editing more and more TV spots. So it's one of those sort of strange ways that you sort of find, find your path. But um, like I said, it's, it, that was my path. It was weird. I guess it was just some sort of this fun goal that I had no idea if I'd ever be able to do. And then I tried different things that put me in the area to be able to do it. And then when I saw the opportunity, even though it was, you know, dating the person who scheduled all the tape vault, I took it. I tried it out. Absolutely. And I think it, it really is important to, to really notice and emphasize, especially as college students, that we really have to start somewhere. And, you know, I definitely can resonate with that. And, you know, I was a Disney intern as well. And I was working in op operations at Toy Story Mania. And so I definitely know it's it's a super, if you have that goal in mind and you, you know you want to do a certain thing or industry, work with a certain company, um, you just have to keep on putting that time, putting yourself out there, taking those risks and keep working hard towards all of your professional professional goals. And I think that is fantastic and, and really is all about who you know as well. So the, the networking aspect we will talk about shortly, um, but definitely is a huge area to emphasize because networking truly is everything. Um, so thank you so much for your first responses to that question. Um, so we're going to move on to our next question here. So we have for our next question, um, as students in college, we're surrounded by opportunities to grow outside of the classroom. There's various extracurricular opportunities, such as joining a club or organization, working on campus for internships, or even off campus, and even throughout our social lives. So with that being said, what extracurricular involvement did you participate in during college that helped you with your career? Or what do you wish you had taken advantage of during college that might have helped you with where you currently are today? So we're going to start with Rob for this one. Uh, okay, so for me, I, uh, I know we talk, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about networking and things, but um, I, I, I'm not a fan of like, I, I networking is incredibly important, but it's not natural for me, even though Professor Costantino might disagree. It's hard for me. Um, so when I think about extracurricular activities that um, helped my career, it was really just trying to meet people and force myself to meet people through different jobs. So I just found a bunch of different jobs where I would meet people and get to just try stuff out uh, so that when 
the opportunity came, I was able to apply some experience to whatever it was that I needed to do. So, um, for example, um, if I think through, I was um, I was working as a as a server at a restaurant, and I had asked the manager of the, of the restaurant again, "Hey, is there any more I can do? Like, I'll like any extra shifts I can do, like in the office, so I can learn stuff." Um, and I was tallying receipts. And when it came to my job with Disney for lifeguarding, they had, I guess, a lot of lifeguards. And I, you know, they said, what other life, what other experiences do you have outside of lifeguarding? And I said, well, I used to like work in the restaurant and I was able to like work in the receipts and I'd have to like go into the ledger and figure out if the numbers matched up and everything. Like, it gave me good exposure to office work. Um, and I enjoyed that. So for me, I always found different jobs uh, where I get to meet people and I would just get there and try to see what more I can learn outside my role is probably the best way to say it. And I did, you know, everything, like I said, you wouldn't think serving would help, but um, it really did. Like I, I just tried to learn the restaurant side of it. I would stay after with the manager and understand how they calculated all the drinks that were done because it wasn't as computerized back then and things like that. So that was, uh, that was my piece was I worked a lot, but in things where I tried to learn stuff. Absolutely. And I think that's great. And uh, one of the one of the great public speakers that I've heard of before, Lee Kitchen, he he has installed in my brain the yes and mentality. And it's all about, you know, especially if you're working or even in a creative setting, just take on those take on those jobs, you know, really immerse yourself, try to diversify your skill set and, and really try to you know use all those skills in your own little personal professional toolbox and help. And hopefully, you know, all of them will pay off when when hoping to apply somewhere new or, or really network with individuals and tell them where you have experience. Um, so thank you so much, Rob, for that one. And now we're going to transition over to Mark. Thank you. Uh, so the one thing I will say that was a missed opportunity for me, and I'm going to talk about my extracurriculars, was studying abroad. I didn't study abroad. I flirted with it. I, when it push came to shove, I didn't do it. So if you have the opportunity and the means to do it, obviously right now, it's probably not a thing. But should the opportunity um, come up over the next couple of years, can't recommend it enough. Um, anyway, extracurricular activities. I didn't really do anything participating in school. I was taking 22 units a semester by the time I got to CLU between Moore Park and Kowloon and then working. So everything I was doing was working. And then the stuff that really fostered my development for my career um, <clears throat> came in two ways. One was going to trade shows with my dad. Uh, that really forced me to get out there and network because, A, you're on a trade show floor. That's the only thing anybody's doing in that space. So you got anywhere from 3,000 to 10,000 people, depending on the show, um, all shaking hands and kissing babies and doing all that stuff, right? So, And then the other part of that is that was the only way I was going to get a job. So um, those th that developed a lot of those skills. But I think as far as the cross training, the things that taught me really how to work, a lot of the stuff that Rob touched on, you know, with like serving, working in other departments, asking other managers how certain things work. Uh, that was stuff I've done throughout my career, um, constantly trying to figure out what the person next to me is doing, um, how their job function works, how it relates to the overall enterprise. And in that development throughout your career, just constantly trying to figure out what the people next to you are doing and how your business really works in every facet is to me, like it's a lifetime extracurricular activity that's going to continue to develop you regardless of what you do for a living. Absolutely. Yes. We're, we're always learning and, and definitely a curiosity is a good thing. And especially if you're even just in a work meeting with, with individuals and you're just, you're listening, you're overhearing, seeing how people interact. Like there's even just the, that small little thing could really make a huge difference on, on helping you grow as a professional. And, you know, really, like we mentioned before, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, take on new roles and be curious and try new things. Um, I think it's fantastic. Um, so thank you so much for your responses on that. Um, so we are going to move on to our next question here. So on this next question, uh, so moving forward, we learn also in college throughout our internships that networking is very important. And we know that it's really valuable to foster those positive relationships and also open up any possible employment opportunities through those. Um, and so 
as networking can become a major stressor for those who are more introverted, um, what advice would you give to someone who is more introverted and also struggles with networking, but also someone who's ambitious and really just unaware on how to break that state of social anxiety? So we're going to start with Mark for this one. Okay, well, um, multi multi part answer. Um, so I, what I will say is that networking and sort of what people think of with that personality set does come kind of naturally to me. Uh, I'm a little more extroverted in my personality, but that's not to say that those those rigors and and that those things don't come into play. So just full disclosure, I deal with generalized anxiety, depression, and PTSD. So even though I am um, even though I have maybe a boisterous personality, may you know walk around a room laughing and joking, whatever, doesn't mean I'm not struggling with stuff. So I think across the board, regardless of what your personality makeup is, if you're going to be able to do your job well and you're going to be able to you know meet other people to facilitate your ability to get other jobs, um, taking care of your mental health, whatever that looks like for you, is really really important because you're not going to be able to function without that. So whether that's therapy, meditation, what, you know, working out, diet, all those things and how they come together. I think that's really important. Now, the kind of the ugly truth of networking is that there's like, there's no trick, there's no back door, there's no way to avoid it. Um, it's just one of those things you kind of have to do to an extent, because even if you're in say a research-based job where you don't really have to interact with people, you're not selling anything, you're not trying to get people to buy into an idea, you're still going to have to interview to get that job. So to a certain extent, um, practice, um, doing it with your friends, reaching out to Cindy Lewis in the career center and getting, um, getting counseling, uh, mock interviews, things like that. Um, and going to as many as events as humanly possible, you know, when, when, you know, in the before times and when things start to open up socially, when, when Stefan or, or um, Dr. Gerhard open up um, events at the Westlake Inn or opportunities to meet alumni or, you know, things like that, go. It's awkward. It's nerve wracking. The first 200 times you do it, you'll probably walk out of there feeling like you said something really stupid. And even if you've been doing it for a long time, you'll probably still put your foot in your mouth. So don't sweat it. The only way to do it, the only way to learn it is by practicing it. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's definitely very true that, that um, networking and public speaking in general is, is very rare that you're, you're born natural at it. Um, it really is something that the more that you try it, the more that you put yourself out there and the more that you just do it, um, the more it will definitely pay off for the future. Um, and very often the people who seem like they're naturals at it are still like freaking the hell out internally and they just do a better job hiding it than the average bear. Definitely. Yeah. We're all still learning and we're all still improving and it's definitely super true. <laughs> and just really quick, thank you so much, Gabby, for joining us today. Hello. We have our, an, another wonderful panelist, uh, Gabby. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we're going to have, hello. Um, we're going to have um, Rob answer this as well. And then you will follow shortly after him for this question. Okay. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, Gabby. So, uh, so Let's see. So I agree with everything Mark just said. Um, what I would say is I'll add just a couple of pieces to it. So I, I am not a, a, a strong extrovert. I, I'm introverted. I, I'm not super um, comfy in large groups, even though I do it often. And what I'll say is I just have to compartmentalize my energy, see it as a role and attack it that way. Like it's just, it's my system that works for me. Um, and I, I budget my energy based on how long I expect to be there and, and that's how it works. Um, the couple of pieces I'll add to it is, so one is I've always found that people that network well are generally curious people and they're very genuinely curious is how I'd say it. So it's easy to see when I get people that will come to me and just sort of, I'm one of 150 emails they sent that day of, hey Rob, I'd like to know more about what you do um, versus hey, I, I saw this about you, like this piece was really interesting and I have this that ties into it and I'd love just a conversation to see how these two things sort of, you know, work together. Um, so it, it really, the, the sort of genuine curiosity piece is, it, it comes through and people know it's there and, and when they see that, they wanna help you and, and really sort of 
um, they see themselves kind of back where, where they were and, and they want to help you go forward. The second piece I'd say is you would be amazed at the people you know already today that could help you in ways that you could never imagine. And so I'll just give one strange example, which is uh, I was involved in an armed robbery here in New York City about nine, 10 years ago, uh, where someone, a man had robbed a woman's purse on the street at 8.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning. And I was walking down the street to return a shower caddy to Bed Bath & Beyond. And next thing I knew, I'm triangulating some guy holding a knife and a purse in the middle of the street and two other guys. And one of them turned out to be an undercover cop. And I'm in a, you know, a New York DA's office with the head prosecutor for all violent crimes of New York City giving my sort of summary of what happened. Well, long story short, I, I go to China, I do all these things. I come back to the US, I wanna work in, uh, for the same reasons Mark said, I, I really wanted to work in anti-human trafficking because it's a strong passion point of mine. And I called the DA, the, the, uh, the DA, sorry, the prosecutor that I spent so much time with with my depositions in the, from an armed robber. And I called her and I said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but like, I'd like to start to get to work in anti-human trafficking. And she said, of course I remember you. Like we spent so much time on the, you know, this, she recited all the parts of the case. And now I'm gonna meet with her next week in the uh, New York DA's office to sit with their task force. Turns out she's in charge of prosecuting for anti-human trafficking. And we're gonna sit and talk about how my skills can help them uh, combat, and trafficking in the city. So you'd never, I had, I listed, you know, all these people before that were people in my network that I might know, or would I ever consider this prosecutor to be a big part of my network? No. But when I thought about it, you know, like I said, there are people that you know today who know people that can really help you achieve some of the things you're trying to achieve. So just don't, I would really give a hard look at who you know and who they might know and who they might know and I guarantee if you really break out that tree, you've got a good list, regardless of who you are. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all about who you know and, and making those valuable connections that hopefully can, can lead to you know, where you want to be professionally. It's really, that's fantastic. Um, and so just to reiter uh, reiterate for, for Gabby real quick, we have the, the question all about um, networking, but also some for, for individuals who are more introverted and struggles with it, like what advice would you have for them on how to break that, that state of feeling uncomfortable or a little bit anxious when it comes to networking with individuals that you've maybe never spoken with before? Um, yes, just really quick. Hi, my name is Gabby and I'm a senior accountant for a biotech company currently in Camarillo. Um, so I actually would consider myself more of an introvert, um, Believe it or not, although people, once they meet me, they say the opposite is the case for myself. But um, when I started working, I ended up working with, it just happened to be in my industry. I worked with um, a lot of other people who had been um, in the job field for a long time. So um, I did the professional program at Cal Lutheran with it. And so for professionals, so it was older people in my classes and then also, when I went out into the workforce, it was people who had been there a long time. So they were very comfortable in their own groups already um, as far as networking and being comfortable when we went outside of our office into other work events. So I was actually, I had to pick up quickly and adapt and be able to not let those anxiety feelings get to me. So what I did at first, um, knowing that I was gonna be put in these social situations that at first I was a little bit uncomfortable with, I would volunteer for certain events within my organization. Like when they wanted a committee to put up, um, let's say even like a Halloween event or a potluck. It was some things that were really simple that I felt like I could be comfortable with because my job was not on the line. I would volunteer to participate in these committees. And that's how I got my practice on how to talk to other people and how to be comfortable speaking up in a meeting because it was about things that were not related to my job. Therefore, I never felt like I was in, like in a threat of saying the wrong thing. So I would advise that if you feel a little bit uncomfortable speaking up in groups and especially if you're in a, in a new job and you want to make a good impression, go volunteer for these events that are not as critical to your job and they're more um, of a comfortable environment for you 
and you get your practice on how to work with people and how to talk to others and how to adapt to working with different personalities as well. So when you go out into an actual um, job or an interview or talk to, if you're, you know, into sales, talk to other people, that just, it, it starts coming natural to you. And then you start becoming more comfortable um, speaking with people. And then you start learning how different people speak and react and, and understand their cues so that you're able to hold that conversation without feeling uncomfortable. At least that's what I did and it seemed to work now. I'm perfectly fine in, in a setting or in a group setting speaking and it's not scary. Um, I'm fine with speaking with other people from different companies now and phone calls and now with you know video Zoom that you adapt. Um, it, it's fine. So just start small and then you, you all of a sudden you realize you're not even thinking about it when you're out speaking. Definitely. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, I know based off of personal experience too, um, I think it's definitely really important to, to put in that time and practice. And also for me, I just, I just own it. Like that's literally, it's as simple as that. I just, I own who I am. I, you know, you got to really try to exude that confidence because you work hard um, and you're doing everything that you can to put yourself out there. And that really is a great thing to, to be able to do. So, and definitely practice makes perfect and you'll definitely be more comfortable over time. Uh, so thank you so much to all of our panelists for those questions or for re responses, sorry. <laughs> so um, on the next question that we have here, so as all of you have known, uh, we have faced many challenges this last year due to the pandemic, and it has become very apparent that the job market is nothing like we've ever seen before. Um, so in an already competitive job market, this pandemic has continued to make it even more challenging for students leaving college and looking for a job. So with that being said, uh, how would you suggest a student contributes to move forward or continues to move forward in an increasingly competitive job market? So also, what advice would you give them to really stand out when looking for for jobs in this current situation that we're living in. So we're gonna start uh, with Gabby on this one. Okay, so um, actually, yes, I understand that it could be a challenge. However, I think most of you that are in school now in comparison to some of us who are older and graduated a long time ago, um, you have the advantage that you already are coming in from a tech-based world in out um, working in groups, working with your classmates, um, you have more of the experience to already collaborate virtually, which is really helpful because it actually expands your opportunities when you're looking for a job. You're not necessarily um, having to look for a job locally that you can drive through. You can now pretty much apply for a job anywhere in the country. And so many companies have gone into a virtual setting that you coming in with the experience on using these tools and um, being able to easily go through chats and meetings and do multiple things at the same time on screens is already a huge plus. So I want to throw that out there because um, even when I was still in school, that wasn't the case. I had some online versions of things, but I still met with a lot of my groups in person. Um, it was it was still the case. So in my actual company where I work, we were not all set up to be virtual either because it is a private owned smaller company. So we actually were all in house as well. And we didn't transition into virtual until now. So um, we went through an adjustment period then. So when somebody comes in and says, oh yeah, you know, I've worked in here, you know, different state and I'm in California, but I work with for a company in New York. Um, it's already a plus that they know you're not gonna struggle with that aspect. So um, that's huge. What I would say to try and stand out in the job market now is show your enthusiasm for the job, at least um, where I come from. And in our company, actually, we all share the same consensus that we want the students coming in because we do have a lot of students, actually, because our biotech program um, is designed to attract the, the students come graduating from college for um, two reasons. One's because we want their energy and um, our biotech industry needs it. And then we also are huge supporters of providing the opportunity for, for the younger generation to come into the field. So, but we look for people that come in with enthusiasm. We look for people that are interested in the company that show their interest and that ask questions. Um, even if you don't really care. I mean, just come up with questions about the company to show them you're excited and you're ready to work 
for your position, you're ready to learn. And those people stand out because it's interesting, but we do actually um, get people who actually don't really show that enthusiasm. And so it makes us think, do they really want a job or, or did somebody make them apply for a job? You know, so, so just go out there and be excited because I know when you graduate, you will be excited naturally anyway, but show that to that person that you're interviewing with and chances are it'll go well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gabby. Yes. Enthusiasm is very important, um, especially in like the looking for jobs recruiting process. Cause like Gabby said, like they want to see someone who's, who's excited, who's optimistic and who's ready to take on that job and be excited to continue and do the best job they possibly can. Um, so thank you so much, Gabby. And it really is an interesting point on, on how due to the pandemic, obviously we've had to make a transition to everything basically being remote for a long period of time. And so businesses have had to learn how to adapt to, to having everything remote and having all these virtual, virtual meetings and having people that are living all the, all the way across the country, um, all over the place throughout this virtual and remote, uh, type of job. So, um, it definitely is a, it's an interesting point that, you know, even if we live in California, we can apply to jobs in Texas, or we can apply to jobs in Florida. And a lot of them are probably going to be staying remote depending on the position. So definitely a very interesting point as well. So now we're going to um, have Rob answer this uh, next question here. So for me, I think, uh, agree with everything Gabby said. I think um, it, to me, it's really about what is your story? Like, like really being able to communicate in a short way, what is your story? Why you, what about you? Like what experience do you have in things like this? So when you sit down with a potential employer, they're going to look for, does this person have relevant experience for the role? And if the answer is yes, great. Let's talk about that. And what's your story and how you package that. If the answer is no, then they're immediately going to go to, well, it's still early in their career. Do I think this person has something that's relevant where they develop some skills that they could apply to this? Or do I just generally believe that this person is curious enough, smart enough where they can figure it out no matter what it is? And that goes back to being a hard worker and things like that. And then, you know, the last piece is, do I like this person, right? Like I'm gonna have to come in every day and spend time with this person and do I like them? And so are they being genuine with me? Are they are they enthusiastic, but not over enthusiastic, right? I can't tell you how many people have, have come in and they've just been like, you know, way too much in my face of like, I'll stand outside your door at 7.30 every morning, like waiting for instructions. I don't want that. Like that doesn't sound pleasant to me at all. So um, what I would say is like, it's just try to think of it from a human being perspective of, even if you're working at a pizza restaurant, like what, how, what are you learning or what did you ask to learn at that pizza restaurant that you could apply to whatever it is? Like, uh, and the last piece I'll say is stop worrying about getting paid. So my nephew's 21 years old, wants to work in TV production and things like this. And he was frustrated because one of the internships that he was looking at wasn't paying him. And I said, that's insane. Like you just need to get experience doing this TV production. So go out there and like, just do it for free and stop worrying about making $11 an hour. And like, just gain the skills and knowledge and stop thinking about it. So that's my few cents on that one. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rob. And now Mark Francois. <clears throat> um, I, I definitely agree. First off with, uh, with everything Rob and Gabby said, you know, telling your story, particularly in the interview process, making yourself likable, not being overzealous. It's, it's really, really important. Um, speaking more to, you know, making yourself, continuously employable in an increasingly uh, more competitive market. I think a couple different things. Um, number one, understand how the finances of your, your, your company work. If you can read the p &L of your company, regardless of what function you perform for that company, you're going to have a better understanding of where you fit, where the other pieces in the business fit and where, um, where value is created. And when you're helping your company create value, you're always going to be more valuable, you know, regardless of what your role is. If you're helping your department be more profitable, if you're helping your department be more efficient, whatever, um, to the extent that you can in that, in that function. The other thing is, you know, sort of like Mamba mentality, people are always going to be more talented than you, smarter than you, more connected than you, have more privileges than you. But what people can't take away is if you outwork them, that, that's one thing that really doesn't have anything to do with 
uh, where you came from or, or what you've done so far. It's only about what you're doing right now. Um, the, 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 one of the, the best pieces of advice I ever heard given was um, John Calipari was asked in a radio interview once how with all these one and done players coming through, uh, sorry, for those who don't know, he's the coach of Kentucky basketball and he gets a lot of draft picks who only play for him for a year. So he was asked the question of when you only have a young mind to mold for 12, 14 months at best, and it's really more like six months, um, what can you really instill upon these guys before they go off to the NBA that they can take with them? And he says, um, money has wings and it's fleeting. And if you chase money, it's always going to elude you. But if you chase excellence, money is going to follow you. And, and, and I think that's really true. And I've, and I've seen that play out throughout, throughout my own career and a couple different times taking a job for the money, um, been miserable within six months, but anytime you're pursuing what you love, um, I think you're, you're always going to do your best work. Um, your, um, the, the money will always take care of itself and, um, you're going to find yourself more fulfilled with the work you're doing at the end of the day. And when you're feeling fulfilled, you're just going to be a better employee throughout, throughout your, your time at any company you're with. Absolutely. Thank you so much to all of our fantastic panelists for that. Um, wonderful responses. Um, so we're going to make this transition now to our audience Q and A. So once again, thank you so much for all of our panelists for responding to these questions that we have developed for you today. Now we're going to open it up to the students here that we have in attendance. So if you have any questions for our panelists today, feel free to put them in the chat box below, but make sure you're directly messaging our student host, Bridget Caffrey. And we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can tonight. But in the case that your question is not answered by one of our panelists um, right here and within the next few minutes, um, you also have another opportunity to ask more one-on-one -on -one questions to all of our alumni industry professionals uh, when we're gonna have our breakout sessions uh, following the Q&A. So, and looks like we have our first question here. So our first question that we have is, what can you do to ensure you're getting out of your comfort zone more regularly within your career? And we're going to have uh, Gabby respond to this one first. Um, if, he, if the question refers to feeling uncomfortable because maybe you don't feel like you're experienced enough or you feel uncomfortable because your job entails a lot of um, meetings and group work where you're asked to participate in, um, what you can do to feel comfortable is don't worry about it. Um, every employer, when they hire you, they know where you're coming from. They know that you haven't been out in the workforce for 20 years. They know that you were a student and they know, and if you were hired, you were hired because of all the things we all said right now. You, they, they knew that maybe they could count on you, that you were going to be a good person to train. You were going to be pleasant to work with. So you've already made it past that point to be someone that they appreciate and want in their company. And they're aware of the experience that you may bring on board. So don't let that intimidate you um, to make you feel like scared or, or not comfortable performing a task or, or being in group settings or whatever it may be. So just remember that at the beginning, um, because that can be a barrier for some people sometimes, especially when you are working with people, like I said earlier, who have been there a long time and maybe you know constantly excel at what they're doing and you feel like you're left behind, that, that's not the case. It'll come to you. So just be patient and just take your time and, and listen, listen and observe everybody around you so that you learn as much as you can from them. And that knowledge will then start reflecting naturally on its own. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gabby. And this question is also open to the other panelists, if you guys have any thoughts on this question as well. After you, Mark, please. Could you read that whole question back for me one more time, please? Of course, yes. So um, what can you do to ensure you're getting out of your comfort zone more regularly within your career? I think it's to do the stuff that scares you. You know, when it was sort of when you run down the the scope of what sort of your job responsibilities are or what you know you need to be doing in order to pursue a job in the first place, there's always going to be things that, you know, aspects to that pursuit that 
come more naturally to you, fall right into place with whatever your skill set is. And your, your natural tendency is going to be to do those things and then to avoid the things that scare you do the opposite of that. Um, that, you know, when you're uncomfortable, I find more often than not, you're going to do your best work. So, um, embrace that. And, and that's really the only way to overcome it is just sort of to dive into it and kick it back until it's not scary and uncomfortable anymore. Yeah, for me, I'll add to that. Um, so it's funny, someone today for some reason sent me, a, sent me a quote that I hadn't seen before and maybe everyone knows it, but I don't know it, which is have the courage to suck at something new. And I thought that was really a pretty good quote for today. Like it was, it was nice. Um, so what I'd say is, you know, when you start in your career, you always have people that sort of you like, you work well with, like you're kind of the similar age, similar level when you're young. And I have a number of those that I've worked with throughout my time in Disney. And I'm thinking of one in particular, who's a very successful executive in Disney and has literally like elevated through the same department since we were in our mid to late twenties. And now he's, you know, a vice president doing very, very well and things like this, but he's never worked in any other department. And that's, that's fine. That's his piece. Um, but when I was thinking about going to California to work for communications in uh, Disney animation, you know, he was like, ah, you know, it's a risk and things like this. And, and I just, I've always tried to take risks of, no, that sounds like a lot of fun to try. And so I tried out working in motion pictures. I tried out working in network television. I moved to China and like learned how to speak Chinese and lived there, like opening a park over there and then came back. Like I've, I've done all these things and we found ourselves both as like senior people at Walt Disney World who are kind of in a similar spot again. Like we had a drink with each other. And we're like, this is so cool. Like, it's great. He's very happy with his path. I'm very happy with mine. So what I'd say is the animation one, I hate it. That's like the worst job I've ever had. And it was pretty much because like it was the greatest job, but 90% of it was trying to make the senior executives feel comfortable versus the quality of the work. And I didn't realize how much Hollywood was like that, at least the sliver of Hollywood that I took. So I didn't like that. I failed. Like I just didn't, I didn't want to like conform to it. And I rejected it. I went back, uh, I left the role and, and went back. So um, I, I could have like sort of tucked and said, that's it. I don't want to try new things anymore, but no, like no way. It was still fun. I still grabbed a bunch from it. So I go back to what I'd said earlier is when people ask me about that, I, I have the story for it, right? Like I can tell you this, this is my story. Like this is one of my failures and here's why I think it failed. And here's what I might do differently to combat it, even though you know, it's Hollywood or whatever else, but here's what I, if I was to go back now as 30 years old to do it again, here's what I'd do differently. I'd still try it. I just wouldn't, you know, I would try it with these things in mind. So uh, that's my story. And I was, as I was sitting with the head of that anti-human trafficking organization, I, I mean, he's like, that's the, like the way you just outlined it for me is that's phenomenal. And to have it be described as phenomenal when to me, it's a massive painful failure. Uh, that's pretty good right? Like I'll, I'll take that all day. So I just like, just continue kind of what Gabby said, push it, try stuff out and be okay with like, this is going to be a dark spot, but as long as you learn from it, can explain it. Great. No big deal. Just don't have like seven in a row. Definitely. Yeah. We're always learning from, from experiences that even if it didn't seem great in the time, when looking back, like you said, you have that story, you have those skills that you gained from that experience. And, and it really has Every single thing that you learn in life really does shape who you are as a person and as a professional as well. Um, so that's fantastic. Thank you for all of your responses to that question. Uh, we do have another question. Um, so whoever feels like they would have the best or the quickest response to this uh, answer, we have, um, what is the best answer to a question you've received when interviewing an entry-level candidate and why did it impress you? Um, so whoever wants to go first with that one, um, Well, honestly, I can't think of the best response that I've received. What I can say is I remember specific candidates who, like uh, Robin Marks or earlier, so they were themselves. And you can tell when that's the case because 
you don't receive the typical Google responses to commonly asked questions on interviews kind of thing. Um, so honestly, just being themselves. When I asked about, you know, being how they worked under pressure or something similar, they came up with a story that I wouldn't expect them to say because usually people try to stick to some to a safe zone, something that's going to sound good when you when you're interviewing. You want to sound good, right? That's you you go in mind saying I have to say the right thing. Well, you have to be yourself because we. I, at least I think I can tell when somebody is just coming up with a story that may not always be true. And so, although I could probably come up with something later um, on the spot, I can't think of a particular answer, but other than I do remember the people that I can say, you know what, I think they're being themselves. I think their story, it's true. I think they really went through that experience. I think this really did happen to them. I honestly think they're being honest, you know, even about a specific skill that they may say they have. Um, sometimes it comes off like it's, it's true. And sometimes you have that doubt as an interviewer. Um, we conduct panel interviews most of the time in, in the last roles that I've had. And so that's, there's usually been a consensus when one of us says, you know, I think that's, that's true. They're, they generally had um, answers that were themselves. So um, it goes back to just be yourself, just show your true personality and who you really are because it does really um, come off that way. And sometimes you actually, it works in your favor because you have somebody that just automatically clicked with you, you know, especially in panel interviews, somebody just says, you know, I really like that person. And so it just gave you that big bump up to come up in, in future discussions when we're discussing candidates. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gabby. And then I don't know if any of the other panelists have a quick uh, one minute response to this one, and then we could proceed to the next question after. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, so I was actually kind of frozen for a second when you asked the question, because as I was like thinking about it, um, I couldn't actually remember any one response I'd ever gotten from a candidate. It was really, <clears throat> like Gabby said, there, there's no right answer, I think, to a lot of the questions, unless it's just a sincere answer. Um, when you're, you know, when you've been overly coached or overly rehearsed, it comes through as really insincere. And if I don't think you're being yourself, I got to wonder, well, then who the hell am I going to see on day one if I hire this person? So be yourself, be honest. And that, that's not to say that, you know, framing an answer to be, um, to hype, to highlight you in a positive way is also not a thing, but you know, there's no. It, the, the, it, there's no like flashcard you can study. It's really being yourself. The, the truth of the matter is when you're being asked a question in, in, in an interview, it's less I find about your answer and more the person's looking to see how you answer, how you process that question. And that's going to say so much more about you and, and um, your character to the interviewer anyway. I'll give a 10 second version, which is um, I was in the, the only person I've hired on the spot gave me this, gave me this answer. Um, and at Disney, you don't hire people on the spot. I had to fight HR with this, but the, I had asked a question of, tell me the last thing you were curious about. And the person before gave me this long answer about like, when I was getting my MBA and, and it was, it was clear that they had like this canned answer in their head and they were trying to shoehorn it into the question of what's the last thing you were curious about. And then the next person came in and said, let me think about that. I had read that light is both a particle and a wave. And so I spent two hours reading about how light can be both a particle and a wave. And I was like, great, how can light be both a particle and a wave? And they gave me like a 30 second explanation of all that they read. And I walked away thinking, I guess light can be a particle and a wave. And I was like, that's it. Like it had nothing to do with business, anything, but it's all the things that Gabby and Mark just said, which is it was genuine. It was great. They were succinct. Like it was perfect. And I was like, look, you need to be on the team. Like, let's just figure this out. So Absolutely. for what it's worth. And that's fantastic. Cause I know even for my, myself personally, you know, I've have always thought that going into interviews, you have to nail that perfect response. But I think it's, it's really valuable to know that a lot of it really does just come from your personality and, and who you show you 
you basically are as a, as an individual, your personality and, and being genuine and being authentic and, and really how important and valuable that is, especially in that process of recruitment. So thank you so much for that question or answer. I keep on saying that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so for the Sorry, next really one. quick, let me just add something that I just thought of um, going back because, you know, I understand sometimes when you're in college, you haven't had the chance to work, right? A lot of students come out with the only experience they have is college. So when they're asking you questions, a lot of our questions are oriented towards work because, or at least you think so. But here is one of my favorite answers that I asked somebody, how well do they work under pressure? Um, Can they give me an example of a time when they've been under pressure and how well they work under it? And up to that point, because it was for an accounting position, I had not received an answer other than office space because this is an office-based position and every single candidate, we had interviewed probably about 10 people had given me an office experience um, or even school. And this person said, you know what? I remember when I was in high school, so not even college, um, I was working at McDonald's and somebody threw a drink back at me in the drive-thru window. And that was their story of working under pressure. And they said, I didn't know what to do because that had never happened. And our motto was the customer's always right. And you try to please them. And I didn't know how to handle that, but I really wanted to yell back at them. So they said that was their version of a time when they were under pressure. So keep in mind up to the point, it had all been office because I think the students thought, a lot of these were students too, um, and they've had internships or, or some schoolwork. And they thought they had to make the question focus on something related to the job. Well, this person took it way back to high school and I liked that answer. And I actually, I might've not remembered it earlier, but it just came to mind as we're talking about being genuine that don't be afraid to think that something's not linked to the job. And that to this day was my favorite answer. And I actually wanted to know more about the story. What did you do, you know, to this person? So just throwing that out there. So you can take your stories back in time as well. Perfect. And you'll be memorable. (laughs) Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, Perfect. So moving on to the next question that we have for our panelists today. Um, So once you entered the workforce, was there anything that you wish your university had prepared you for, but didn't? And how did you effectively transition into this new environment? Um, Oh, go ahead, Gabby. Okay, well, my situation at Cal Lutheran was a little bit different because I went through the professional program. So it was, um, at the time, it was called the um, adult education program, which were night courses. So a lot of my classmates at the time were already professionals. They already had a career path that they had established for themselves because um, of the length of time they had spent working in their field. So most of them already had that. So during class, they actually shared stories from their life at work or experiences that I was able to learn from. So um, prior to that, I went to, I did two years at Cal State Northridge before transferring to Cal Lutheran. So at Cal State Northridge, I did have the traditional undergrad program from which I went through my regular courses. Um, So back then, I didn't have those stories about the real life work experience. So at least for accounting, my work life at school versus what accounting really is and what it's like, it's really different. It is really different from from the book world. Um, So thankfully I ended up in this program and I graduated with a lot of knowledge just from other people about what to expect. So things like this um, are helpful um, like like what we're going through right now. And I wish, I'm not sure what would have happened if I had stayed at Cal State Northridge, um, Cal State Northridge for all well, four years, but having the two years there versus Cal Lutheran two years, I didn't have that experience at Northridge. Um, so I wish that it wouldn't just be an event like, like this one. I don't know if Cal Lutheran now offers these more frequently or when they do it, but I wish it was embedded a little bit more into the courses, the real world experience, um, maybe speakers coming onto campus often enough to even the classrooms for those students that don't have time to attend after school events or on weekends, bring them into, you know, part of, part of the curriculum, part of the classroom. 
um, time so that everybody gets the opportunity for those that are limited to just being able to attend the classes. So it may be different now, but at least back then, I wish that we would have had that um, at Northridge because I found the value in it afterwards. Absolutely. And, you know, I really feel like with college in general, you're really skimming the surface of, of what you're going to learn when you're on the job. And so that's why internships are highly valued and, you know, those outside of class experiences. Um, and so those are obviously really valuable and very, very important. Um, and so if Mark or Rob would like to respond to this one as well. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, so <clears throat> one of the, uh, one of the things that I think um, was a, it was a pretty harsh reality for me. And I know some of my uh, former classmates that I've talked about sort of as we've stumbled and fumbled through our careers at times is, um, and it may, it, I, I hope and, and would like to believe that it is changing, but um, college prepares you for what to do when you're a director or a VP or a president. They teach you how to run an organization. They teach you how to work top down. But what I think the thing college fails to prepare you for in your 20s is how badly you're going to get your ass handed to you over the first five to six years. Um, when you come out of school, you're going to work 60 hours a week. You're going to do it for crappy pay. You're going to work for a lot of jerks. You're not going to be respected. You're not going to be cared for. You won't be valued. These things are all this is all going to be stuff that you're going to deal with. And frankly, the only solution is to just roll your sleeves up and like fight through it. And, and, and that is where you're going to learn a lot about yourself. Um, it's going to learn, you're going to learn a lot about what you're capable of. And I, I think that, um, it even started with, with, so I'm 36. It started with my generation. I think our parents wanted to protect us from the world, tell us the world could be anything we wanted it to be. Um, but the reality is generation to generation, um, things have improved, things have gotten easier in some regards, but the world has only gotten more competitive. And at the end of the day, if you're not doing the work, there's 15 other people who are going to be willing to do it. And, um, it may be a little while before you get to use some of the specific skills you developed or picked up in a textbook in school. Um, at the end of the day, the only thing, your, your best asset's going to be showing up and busting your ass. Pardon my French. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, McKenna, I mean, I think we've covered it really well. I know we're tight on time. Um, my, what I would just say is just be humble. Like when you graduate, be humble. It's amazing how fast you'll turn people off if you're not humble. That's it. Absolutely. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, so our next question that we have here, um, we're going to try to have one minute responses for these final few um, questions here um, coming up. So this one is, uh, what is the first thing that we should do as a new employee to develop a strong working relationship with my manager or boss? Um, I'll go ahead and start with that one. So when you start with your manager and boss, um, don't feel intimidated to, once again, be yourself with them. Um, you build a better relationship when you are comfortable being you because you never have to pretend you're someone else. Obviously, there may be times when you don't want to show certain things about yourself because they may be a bit, little bit unprofessional, but that's kind of common sense. Um, so just be yourself and, and show them that you're, you're willing to learn and listen and also start building that communication so that they also know to very well respect you and listen to what you have to say. So don't just go in with nonsense all the time. You know, you're going to say productive things and, and things that, that are helpful and to both of you. So build yourself in, and feel comfortable speaking to them a little bit about you so they get to know you and you get to know them. It's not always just about work. You do need that little bit of a personal touch in order to to build that communication and have it going. Yeah, agree. I think um, for me, it, it uh, to tie onto what Gabby said, like it's you know your boss wants to know that you're on their team, like you're there to be part of the team and support the team, and um, and that's really the most important thing is that you're you're part of it, but you also want to show a little bit about who you are. So, you know, I would, 
I, I would joke with my bosses that um, like, you know, it, it's great that you, I hear you play golf. It's great. Just know that if we ever go on the golf course, you will not beat me on the golf course, regardless of your rank and title and whatever else. And that's just how it's going to be. Um, Cause I'm a competitive guy and I like to golf uh, or it might be a different interest that we would, that we talk about. So I'd want to share a little bit about who I am and, um, and try to just break down those barriers a little bit. But again, a theme you're hearing from everyone today in a genuine way. Like it's things that it's a conversation you'd hear me have with friends, family members and things. Um, so that's, that's my two cents. The one thing I'd say, uh, first, I, I really like everything that Gabby and, and Rob said, you know, being sincere, being invested, being humble. Those are, those are really key. Um, I think one of the larger things you can do, and you can take this with you from job to job, not necessarily just your first job, is try to find something that's in a field you care about, um, whether it is a, you know, a political or a social cause or some kind of activism cause or some, you know, uh, innovative tech that, you, that you're you really interested in, or if you've been, you know, been in love, in, you know, like Rob, you know, following in into entertainment. Um, find ways to do your job in arenas that are things you would do in your spare time anyway because any enterprise is always going to be more successful when the employees are invested because they're going to be innovating for that company for that that cause whatever that is um and when you find it when you love what you do and you find it a little easier to get up in the morning or effortless on the days that are great, it's certainly going to make the days that are not, because even if you have a job that is in a field you really love and care about, you're still going to have a lot of crappy days. It's just the nature of work. So being in something that you know you're serving a cause or uh, a field that you really care about will definitely help to minimize some of the, or uh, mitigate um, the strain of those tougher days. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then we have this one as well. Um, what is something that would surprise people about your day to day um, with working? It's more of a general question, but you could definitely take in any direction that you think would be best. <laughs> uh, in my case, what would surprise people? It's probably personal right on our level um, would be that I work for a biotech company. Um, that was not something that I used to really think much about. Um, I didn't really know the difference between a bi biotech, pharmaceuticals. I didn't really know much of that. I was a business student, not into science. And um, so probably the most surprising thing is the industry that I'm in, um, in a minute, because I believe in what they're doing. Um, by the way, it's cell therapy treatments. Um, it's a, a new way of, of healthcare that's coming out and um, it's really exciting. Actually, it's more of a natural rather than pharma type, but um, that's that's different because I never expressed interest in that area. And like uh, Mark and Rob had said before, you have to work for something and, and do something that you love. So even in working in business or finance or accounting, like I'm in, um, just because it's that type of job doesn't mean that it's any different from being the actual scientist out in the lab. I feel just as invested and as, as excited in the industry. So not only do I do what I love as my job, finance and accounting, I feel like I am part of helping create something amazing, um, even though I'm not the one out there, but I'm part of this organization and they're still my team and it's still my coworkers. So that's probably it's probably just that, that I never expressed the interest and somehow I landed in this industry and I love it. And I've learned a lot about it. So it's actually pretty exciting. So you never know where you might end up. You may think you want to be in a specific industry, but you just never know. Things may change and that's okay. Absolutely. That's why it's, it's really important to, to try new things and, and really explore those different opportunities. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like to have fun, like with my work, I really I mean, even with some of the terrible things or whatnot, like, there are, there's always a way to have fun and enjoy the people you work with. But I think what would surprise people too, is that I, I always do my homework, right? So for me, it's, 
I, I just a couple of minutes ago got an email from a, from the CEO of a hydrogen propulsion system, and I can tell by the tone of his email that he doesn't think I did my homework on this, and so he's going to get a very different response tonight. Um, so my point is, like, it's it may surprise people that someone likes to joke around, or you know, if you have a lot of responsibility, that you have to be serious all the time. You don't. Like, I'm the same guy. If we're out having a beer, then I am in the office, and I like that consistency because that's just me. But don't ever expect that I'm not going to do my homework. Like that's just I'm going to come with a stack of comments like this, of all the things that like you that I should be doing. Quite frankly. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> don't have too much to add to that. I don't personally. I don't think that there's too much about me that surprises people once they get to know me. It's a fairly it's a fairly open book, but. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good answer to that question. Okay, no worries. So we're going to move on to another one. We have, what accomplishments do you feel set you apart? Um, I'm not sure that I can say necessarily set me apart um, because most of my accomplishments have been accomplishments that of goals that I've made for myself. Um, whether it be moving up the ranks at my positions, I've always somewhat had um, a goal of what I wanted to be or where I wanted to get to. Um, in accounting and finance, there's different titles and positions you have to go through to get to a certain place, right? So, um, and for example, in the accounting for an internal company, you want to be the controller, the corporate controller at eventually when, when you get to that level, um, being different from a CFO, right? So, um, so knowing that I, I can't say necessarily they set me apart from anybody other than I'm just satisfied with the goals myself. Um, whether it be at work or the work I've done out, um, you know, in the community, um, being part of organizations and, and volunteer programs or, you know, executing those tasks. So, so really, um, I don't know. I never really answered that to anybody, I, honestly, other, other than myself, other than saying, you know, I'm proud of that and maybe share it with my kids or something, but normally I don't really say I have anything that's any different, you know, than, than other people. I don't know if that's a good enough answer. That's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and then if um, Mark or Rob, we're going to finish up within the next, once you guys are done, we're going to, that's going to be our closing remarks. But yeah, what, what I'll say is that's um, a good, a good, that question is a good opportunity to talk about priorities. I'll be honest with you. If you had to ask me that question, I, maybe I could put it down on my resume, but frankly, it makes me as uncomfortable as it might make some of you coming out of school answering that question. Um, Cause what I find is it, when you're setting your priorities and when you're set as, you know, setting the metrics of what you are satisfied with, what you're fulfilled by in your work, if you're looking for those benchmarks, chances are um, you're going to find yourself unfulfilled. And what I mean by that is you really want to fall in love with the process of whatever job it is you're doing and getting better at that process and improving that process and approaching it. Um, like Rob had touched on before with humility. Um, I think if you're looking for flowers, if you're looking for trophies, if you're looking to set records or get certificates, um, you may do that for a while, but ultimately, um, you're going to, you're going to fall short. You're going to be unfulfilled. You're going to find yourself in a series of dead end jobs that you're not really happy with. Um, so be less concerned with the accomplishments or the badges or, you know, whatever, and be more, take more pride in, um, improving your craft every single day, regardless of what that is. Yeah. Uh, what I'll just quickly add is that, uh, what I thought some of my accomplishments were is really not what people care about. Like I, for me, it's, I thought the fact that I like negotiated with, I don't know, 12 different governments around the world and like done all this international experience. I taught myself how to speak Mandarin at 40. Like I thought going in, people would be like, wow, you speak Mandarin and you've done all these things. And, and I thought that was going to be awesome. And nobody cared. 
um, what really people were sort of gravitating towards me for was the fact that what I figured out later on, again, going back to having your story is that I'm very comfortable and excel in a gray area. When things aren't super defined for an organization, for a department, for an objective, whatever else, I'm more comfortable than most working in that gray area and shaping it. And that I have a reputation for it. Like those that work with me sort of have passed me on as being that person. So nobody cares I speak Chinese unless we're in China, at which point we have interpreters and no one cares that I've done all this other stuff. So for me, it was kind of a learning experience of learning what others thought was set me apart was different from what I thought. And I wish I had gone through that exercise earlier and just asked people like, what do you think sets me apart? Because I guarantee you, I would have gotten that answer years before. I still would have learned Chinese and all those things, but I don't know, it might've saved me from some other things. Perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much to all of our panelists for wonderful responses to all of our questions submitted from our audience today. Um, so that does conclude our Q&A for the night. So thank you so much to everyone who has submitted your questions. I hope you found all their responses to be very insightful and valuable in helping you find your own career path. Um, I would also like to thank all of our panelists once again for taking the time to speak with all of us tonight. Um, so if any of the panelists have any final words of advice for students, feel free to do so. Otherwise, thank you all so much. Um, I just wanna say, um, good luck out there when you go out into the workforce. Uh, have fun, enjoy what you do. Like Mark said, enjoy the process. Um, you're gonna run into hurdles, definitely. You may be disappointed the first time you go out there and find out you're not getting paid what you thought your career was supposed to pay. Or you're gonna find out that your workers are not as friendly as your classmates were in class. Um, you're gonna find all those things out. And you're gonna find out that if you said, Let's say, you know, I had said I wanted to work in a biotech company and I go work there and I'm excited and I find out I don't really like it. Um, don't let that make you feel like you failed or like you didn't achieve your goal. That's not the case. These are things that you just imagine you would do, you imagine that you would be at, but it's going to change. It's for sure going to change. I have yet to meet anybody that I work with and have worked with for a long time or have you know anybody in my finance team who has been doing this for years. I have yet to meet anybody that says they're at the place that they imagined. I have heard that they are very satisfied with their life because like Rob said, their priorities change and things that you thought were really important in the career or as an employee, it changes. Of course, it's important to move up. Of course, eventually you're going to get new titles and you're going to be recognized for achievements. But at the end of the day, it's what you love, how, how well you get along with people is extremely important. It has become one of the most important factors, I think, in, in team players rather than you know, a, a snooty coworker who knows everything about the job, but it's impossible to deal with. So people rather just not work with them sometimes and that's going to happen so just enjoy the journey um, have fun with it and be ready for changes and accept the changes and embrace the changes and enjoy all those lessons that are going to come your way in many different forms from personal to job to even making a complete switch in careers you know try out different departments sign up for that strange weird committee do all those things and, and enjoy the process because it'll go by really fast. Thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you. Two, two best pieces of advice people gave me that I'll say is one is never trade money for learning until you're after 30. Um, like your job until you're 30 is to learn and never, ever, ever trade money uh, for learning before that. And the second one is this is going to be later in your career, but it's sing like the single greatest financial advice I was ever given, which is a bonus is a bonus. It's not part of your salary. So never, ever spend it. So my boss, who is now the CEO of Virgin Galactic was at the time, like 20 some years ago, I took it serious. And I've literally never spent a dollar of any bonus I've ever gotten in my life. Cause I was like, it's really good advice. And it sort of piles up. So just like never, those are my two pieces. Like don't trade money until you're, until after you're 30 and don't spend your bonuses, save them and invest them. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> um, first, it would be be humble, be flexible and be diligent. Um, 
the, those three things are, I think, going to serve you throughout your career. Um, <clears throat> don't rush it. You know, that, that is to me, like, like Rob said, don't trade, don't trade money for, for education, especially before you turn 30. I can't, I can't agree with that enough. I think that's, that's so, so, so important. And, um, don't, don't ever stop asking questions, you know, keep, you know, use the resources around you. If you feel like, you know, you have friends or, you know, act, access to people who are more successful that you think they're, they're doing really well, you know, they're doing something that you don't understand and you want to learn more about ask like you, you're what's the, the old Gretzky quote is like, you miss hundred percent of the shots you don't take. It's, you know, ask, 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 always be asking questions, always be curious. And, and a lot of times you'll stumble into stuff that you think is, you know, unnecessary in the moment. And then it'll come back five, 10, 15 years later. Um, and be like, Holy crap. I can't believe it. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll jog itself back into your memory. So. Perfect. Thank you so much to all of our fantastic panelists. Like I mentioned before, um, this event really would not be possible without your, your engagement here with all of our students. So thank you so much. Um, so next on the agenda, we have all of our small breakout groups. So this is really your opportunity to break into small groups with past Cal Lutheran alumni who, are, who have joined all of us tonight, uh, who are ready to answer any questions that you might have for them. So this is also a fantastic opportunity to network with these individuals. So definitely take advantage of all this um, take advantage of this opportunity to build those strong relationships tonight. Um, but before this occurs, we're going to have Bridget, who's going to be joining us again to give us a little bit more information on how the breakout groups will be proceeded with. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, McKenna. And thank you to our incredible panelists, Mark, Rob, and Gabby for offering those insights. And then again, thank you, McKenna, for moderating that discussion. So we will now, like McKenna said, be transitioning into the breakout sessions with our table leads but remember to stick around for the raffle that will take place after the breakout sessions. So we are so grateful for these table leads for volunteering their time to share their experiences with the job search post-grad with us as they were once in our position. So there's much for us to learn from these experiences. I'm personally grateful for this opportunity to network. I was a transfer student to Cal Lutheran my junior year. So I didn't have many opportunities such as this prior to transferring to Cal Lutheran. So I'm looking forward to gaining insight into a career in marketing and the opportunities and necessary skills to best prepare myself for that future career and hope you all can gain that insight as well. So you will be assigned and sent to a breakout room based on your specific industry of interest from pre-registration, but you will have the ability to move throughout the breakout rooms, other ones that may interest you using the Google Doc with the details about the different table leads. So to leave a room, select the blue icon in the bottom right corner and hit leave breakout room and then navigate over to the left a little to the breakout room icon and click join to join a different breakout room. So you will now be assigned to a breakout room in a moment, but if you are not, just give us a moment and we will put you in a room. I hope you all enjoy gaining insight from these alum. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Kelvin. I'm a junior um, here from COU. And it's that time of the night where we start our uh, raffle. To be entered into the raffle, uh, please complete the survey through the link posted in the chat. Um, we have a whole list of prizes. Right off the bat, we have Urbane Cafe with a dinner for two. Um, it, you can redeem it at any of the 20 plus locations all around um, the county. We also have a VectorVest subscription. VectorVest is an investment in portfolio management system. It rates, analyzes, um, graphs over 16,000 different stocks every single day. So this is a great resource for anybody that's interested in personal finance, investing, uh, finance, anybody that's starting out or is already interested. We also have a Pacific Coast Business Times subscription. Um, this is a great way to learn what's happening locally from a business lens. We also have Chick-fil-A, the Chick-fil-A located right down uh, from the campus on Moore Park Road. They're giving you a free meal. You can either get a, a sandwich or some nuggets with some fries and a drink. And then we also have some COU gear. So again, the link is in the uh, chat. Please take the survey, then you'll be automatically entered. 
uh, to win these prizes. And then uh, to claim your prize, you would just need to email Susan. Uh, Susan Wood, her information is also going to be in the chat. Uh, so good luck to you guys and may the odds be in your favor. I want to give a big thank you to our sponsors um, and partners, Chick-fil-A, Urbane Cafe, Vector Vest, and the Pacific Coast Business Times. Um, I really, really encourage you guys to check them out if you're hungry or if you want to learn more about um, business, you're interested. Um, this is a great way uh, to um, eat something delicious or learn something new. So also, if you have not connected with the COU School of Management, um, I really encourage you guys to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram. And I really encourage you guys to connect with the people uh, that you met today, whether it's um, the Dean Gerhard uh, or people you met in your breakout rooms. Um, this is a great way to connect with each other and and learn new things. So I really encourage you guys to do that. And then I also wanna thank those who participated in our social media giveaway. Um, it, if you follow uh, our Instagram and, and our other social media, uh, you won't miss any future giveaways. So I really encourage you guys to do that. You guys can win really cool things um, for our social media giveaway. We also gave away uh, Urbane Cafe meal for two, and we also gave some CLU gear. So this is really, really, uh, you know, what we uh, want to give back to you guys. So uh, please um, sign up for future giveaways. And uh, you can also learn about other events that can help you uh, plan out, you know, what you want to do and meet people. And it's really important, especially now during um, COVID. COVID times. <laughs> I hope you guys had some takeaways. We're really happy that you all attended. And in a way, we're all winners because we were able to connect with each other today. And, you know, thank you for making the most out of it. It, it really makes us proud. And that's all we have for you guys tonight. So have a great evening. And I really hope to see some of you next year. Thank you guys so much for attending. I hope you found everything from the panelists to be super insightful and super valuable to helping you find your own path. Um, and thank you so much for, for, uh, for saying this entire event and make sure you follow all the School of Management social media as referenced before. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Have a great night, everyone.